Bob Mueller. I'm the <coughs> president of the Foundation for Restoration. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Bob Pretty graduated from the University of Missouri School of Journalism in 1963. I guess I shouldn't put that in there. <laughs> he worked at KLIK radio station until 1974 when he became the news director of Missouri Net. He maintained that position and gave a daily program on Missouri history called Black Across the Wide Missouri until he retired in uh, until he retired in uh, <laughs> Must be you. You're magnetic. Yeah. I'm stand over here. Um, in 1977, Bobby uh, started an effort to have the Missouri Supreme Court uh, be open for broadcast. I mean, that's, that was pretty, kind of in the early days, and it's still photography uh, coverage. Many, recognizing his many contributions to the, uh, via the radio, he was inducted into the Missouri Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame in 2018, and was the first news director to twice lead the Radio Television Association. In 2002, uh, the University of Missouri awarded Bob Pretty a Journalism School Honor Medal, its highest recognition uh, of distinguished service to the profession. <clears throat> I've been blessed to work with Bob for probably the last 12 years or so on the, the State Historical Society Board. I've watched him do interviews on tape, never be the interviewee. <laughs> <laughs> As someone said, he is not afraid to ruffle feathers. And he's interviewed, I don't know how many senators and representatives. Uh, he's uh, served on the executive committee of the State Historical Society and is the current president elected in 2016. He's done five books, uh, including his latest one, which is on the art of the Missouri Capitol, which is phenomenal. It's a very beautiful book. And he's working on another book, soon to be out, about the rebuilding of the uh, capital of, after the 1914 fire. So please welcome Bob Pretty, who will present, let he who is without a quarry throw the first stone, <laughs> building the Missouri capital. Thank you, Bob, it's good to be here. back in St. Genevieve, uh, my wife and I have not been here for several years. Uh, I don't remember the last time we were in town. It was sometime after the new cemetery opened, but I can't <laughs> But uh, we wanted to come back here quite often. We just never have worked our way over here because there are just as you know, if you travel anywhere around here, Missouri has no direct roads to anywhere, <laughs> unless you're between St. Louis and Kansas City. But uh, so we really enjoyed being here, and, uh, and the Miller has been such great hosts. So we appreciate working with Bob, and we appreciate uh, everything that St. Genevieve means to the state of Missouri. And I wish more of our communities had sessions like this that pinpoint area history. Um, Nancy, would you bring me my water bottle? I forgot that. But uh, something like this is really important in creating pride in an area, so I'm glad to be here to talk about St. Genevieve's role in the construction of our present capital. <coughs> if you go to the third floor of the capital and you go into the legislative library and climb Thank you, a very tall library ladder to get up to the shelf that contains the volumes, the bound volumes of the journals of the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate for the 1919 session. And you open them and you start to read those journals. You'll find almost nothing special about them, about what is written. <laughs> 
First day, Wednesday, January 8th, 1919, Senate called to order by Honorable Wallace Crosley, Lieutenant Governor and President of the Senate, prayer by the Reverend E.H. Foster. That's how the procession starts. The Journal of the House is very similar. First day, Wednesday, January 8th, 1919, the House was called to order by the Honorable John L. Sullivan, Secretary of State. Prayer was offered by the Reverend L. M. Proctor of Jefferson City. And if you ever read a legislative journal, you realize that these journals don't reflect any of the drama that goes on in the legislative chambers. I've covered many, many filibusters, some that lasted overnight. And all that's ever recorded in the journals is who was presiding in the chair at the time. Several times, of course, the presiding officer has to change. But none of the debate is recorded in the official journals of the Missouri General Assembly. So 1919, that's the way that session started. It's hardly routine, though as the journals would like to indicate, but that's the way legislative journals are. They don't portray all of the words that are spoken or the emotions with which they're spoken. It is not likely that the House and Senate journals on January the 9th, 2019, will be any different. In fact, they'll be the same, except they'll fill in different names. But on that day in 1919, the members of the House and the Senate were meeting for the first full legislative session in the new capital. And on January the 9th, 2019, the members of the General Assembly will be meeting on the 100th anniversary of that, meet, of that first full legislative session in the capital. They'll be sitting behind the desks that their predecessor sat behind in 1919. Uh, the presiding officers will be behind the same daises that Wallace Crosley and John L. Sullivan were, were behind 100 years ago. 100 years and one day earlier, in a legislative session that, among other things, allowed women to vote in Missouri. They will meet in the same historic building in which their predecessors have served for a century. Our capital was built in a remarkably short time, about four years. Um, by comparison, the Pennsylvania capital took eight years to build, and the construction was filled with scandal. Arkansas was even longer and more scandal. Arkansas took 16 years under three different contractors and four different architects and people went to jail. Then. <laughs> the New York Capitol took 33 years. And if you've ever been to Albany, you know the New York Capitol is a mess. <laughs> it has, I think, four or five floors and there were different architects for four floors. <laughs> which kind of tells you why that was by our Capitol Commission that oversaw our Capitol looked at Albany and said, this building represents everything that is wrong in the construction of state capitals. But as remarkable as the construction of our capital in four years was, it could have been much shorter if it had not been for a year-long argument with the American Institute of Architects over the contest that was held to pick the contractor and the architect, and a contractor who thought that he could make a killing by ignoring a major specification and an Indiana Stone Company owner who was his ally in St. Genevieve County was right in the middle of all of this for a long time. A lightning bolt hit our capital on February 5th, the Sunday night in 1911, and set the dome on fire, and the fire eventually spread down and spread over the rest of the building and gutted it. And on August the 1st, 1911, a special election was held to pass a bond issue to put up a new capital. It was approved overwhelmingly. A special commission was appointed a couple of months later to oversee the entire process. And after a long struggle with the Architects Institute, the commission selected the architectural firm of Tracy and Swartout, New York, to build and design our capital. Um, they'd never designed a capital before. A lot of capitals were designed by people who'd never designed capitals before. Tracy left the firm in 1915 to join the Army and became one of the founders of the Army's camouflage corps during World War I. So Edgerton Swartout, the remaining partner, is really the hero of the design and construction of our capital. He oversaw the construction and he spent hours quite often as a mediator between the Capital Commission Board and the contractor. Within days after the election, um, an Eastern Stone contractor was declaring it will be impossible to erect the Missouri State House with limestone unless the stone is purchased outside of the state. But President S.M. Lederer from the Pickle Stone Company of St. Louis, which was the third largest stone cutter in, in the country at that time, called those arguments folly 
and he said there is no doubt the supply of limestone, an unlimited supply of limestone, exists in Missouri after he toured the state's quarries, and he pointed especially to operations near Carthage, to the Phoenix Quarry, which was a company in Kansas City but had a quarry near Springfield, and those were two that he especially pointed out as having more than an adequate supply of limestone. The St. Louis architect Isaac Taylor disagreed. He said either granite must be used in the capital or the stone must be shipped from other states. The Carthage stone will not be satisfactory and other limestone in other quarries now developed cannot produce the class of material desired. I do not know of any deposits where sufficient material can be produced. He was boosting the granite industry in Southeast Missouri. Um, quarry operators in Carthage fired back. If Mr. Taylor thinks Carthage produces no stones large enough with which to build the capital, he should read the tale of a gigantic slab from a Carthage quarry, 70 feet long, eight and a half feet wide, and five and a half feet thick. And they claim that the bluffs along the Spring River contain more than enough stone, in fact, to build, there was enough stone there, they said, to build a state house for every state in the nation. So the stone and the contractor issue soon became complicated and intertwined. Uh, it delayed construction. It produced at least one bribe offer, as well as lawsuits and threatened lawsuits, and it added immeasurably to the strain on the board and the architect during the entire process. And much of this time, there was a coal miner and would-be stone entrepreneur from Mulberry, Kansas, who either made himself a nuisance or provided comic relief. I can't really tell from his story where it comes to. It was interesting. I enjoyed reading it from the comic relief standpoint when I was looking through the boards. State geologist H.A. Bueller uh, quickly put together a report on the Missouri quarrying industry, and he told the commission board, uh, board chairman E.W. Stevens, the most important and best developed areas are located in the vicinity of Carthage, Phoenix, Graniteville, and Sinai. With perhaps some additional equipment, I believe that these districts can supply the necessary stone but he thought that Missouri granite and limestone from the Burlington Formation will supply all necessary requirements and result in a beautiful building. The board asked in early December of 1911 for samples of stone not less than one foot square from the Sinai Granite Company of St. Louis, the Phoenix Limestone Company, and from Logan and Wright in Carthage. Quarries in other states were showing interest too, although the commission was bound by state law to use only Missouri materials, uh, if at all possible. So two days before Christmas in 1911, a hopeful Daniel Spoonhauer wrote to the board from Mulberry, Kansas, offering to donate enough red and gray granite for a building from his quarry in Stone County, down in southwest Missouri. There was a hitch. Spoonhauer had not opened the quarry down there. <laughs> and he wanted the state to do the mining operations for him. There was another hitch too. The rail, nearest railroad was nine miles away. So even if they were able to cut the stone, how are they going to ship to Jefferson City? The lobbying intensified with the Joplin Globe featuring a massive two-page advertisement with a prominent headline. Now, I'll bet you've never seen a headline like this. With an inestimable, inexhaustible amount of Carthage white stone available and most modern of facilities to quarry it, Jasper County stands ready to furnish the building material for the new $3,500,000 Missouri capital to be built in Jefferson City to replace the historic old state house, which was destroyed by fire just one year ago. <laughs> now you know why it took two pages. <laughs> The text noted there was enough stone to keep the quarries working for 163 years. But for the board, the board would not be stampeded by all of this. Members inspected some quarries in April of 1912. They didn't find anything adequate other than in Carthage. Chairman E.W. Stevens, who was a newspaper publisher from Columbia, was named the Committee of One to visit the rock quarry in St. John. He reported the quarry seemed to have good stone for building purposes, but he said it was wholly undeveloped, there being no plant at the place to quarry the stone or prepare it for market. Commissioners A.A. A. Spear and J.C.A. Hiller, who inspected quarries in the Union area, told the board the quarries had stone of excellent quality for ordinary building purposes, but not of the quality or quantity needed to justify the hopes of the people of the Union that it might be used in the construction of the new capital. Daniel Spoonhauer, who had been quiet since January, launched a new effort in the fall of 1912 to get the commission to use his stone. 
a rambling five-page letter appears to be one long sentence. Daniel was not a big on periods of comments from everybody else. He defended his unopened quarry and he threatened to expose the commission already having decided against him. The letter responded to a published statement by the state geologist that he had never heard of Grant being in Stone County. However it may be, as party told me, who is fairly well acquainted with things in the state of Mo, that the powers that are in control will defeat my offer by hook or crook, fair or foul. It looks that way. However, I will come back. I'll place the whole matter before the taxpayer of Mo, being one myself, and let the parties who are in this explain to the taxpayer some of their actions like these fake front page reports or plain reading advertisements don't go and any fake report by the state geologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Daniel Spoonhauer might have lacked a lot of education, but he did not lack passion. <laughs> so Stevens patiently responded to Daniel, um, saying there was no desire to discriminate against anybody as far as picking stone for the new building, but there were guidelines. The stone had to be of sufficient quality and quantity. Uh, the quarry had to have the facilities, the workers, and the appliances necessary to supply the stone for the building. And it had to be open in 1912, the quarry did. Because they wanted this thing built as soon as possible. The original goal was to have it built by 1915. So the discussion about the stone for the building opened in 1912. It intensified in 1913, and in March, it intensified even further with the arrival of one A.S. Bachman, a partner in a New York marble firm uh, in Jefferson City to inspect limestone and cotton rock that might be used for veneering and wainscoting in the building's interior if the stone could be taken out of the ground in large enough slabs. He said the architects were much impressed with the area's cotton rock, which is a form of soft, chalky, uh, and porous limestone, and they had sent him to inspect it. But he turned out his interest in cotton rock was short lived. Stone had been an issue since the June 1912 meeting when the board met with the architects in New York to talk about designs and construction. The board had compared samples from Phoenix and Carthage with stone from Southeast Missouri and decided the prices of various kinds of stone through Bachman, who visited Missouri quarries in March. Uh, he said he thought Phoenix and Carthage stone would be better than Indiana limestone for the building. The completion of the design drawings in mid-August started the process of assembling materials to build the capital. The board told the architects, it occurs to us, the chief difficulty will lie in securing stone promptly from the quarry. We're limited to the state of Missouri and to practically two quarries in the state, those at Carthage and Phoenix. Others may be developed, but it hardly seems now possible. Well, Spoonhauer had heard of the plans and specifications for the stone, and it, he certainly had been approved. He wrote, it is a plain fact that a conspiracy to defraud a taxpayer of his right has been approved by you and the state capital commissioners. Therefore, I ask for an explanation. If same is not satisfactory, the state may have a big damage suit on its hands, and the next session of the legislature may select a commission who are on the square. The commission had a bigger concern than Spoonhauer Spain, Spain, by now. The behavior of the man that Tracy and Swarthout had sent out to inspect the quarries was far more alarming because Stevens was shocked to learn that, that Mr. Bachman had met with representatives of the Phoenix and the Carthage Quarries to discuss stone specifications of Tracy and Swartout. And uh, Stevens told the architects that Bachman had tried to cut deals with Carthage and Phoenix and had even taken an interest in the Phoenix Quarry, claiming to be able to exercise important influence in determining who got stone cut. The commission wasn't going to tolerate that and let Swartout know about it, because Swartout immediately said he knew nothing of any such maneuvering by Bachman with the two quarries, and he accused Bachman of trying to stir up trouble where there is not the slightest possibility of there being any cause for trouble, and Bachman was never heard from again. <laughs> One day, a representative from a stone company from Bedford, Indiana, showed up at Jefferson City and dropped in on the commission offices, and he said he was researching Missouri Bedford. He told the commission secretary, J. Kelly Poole, the stone in Missouri was similar to the Bedford stone in Indiana, <coughs> found near Bedford, Indiana, and in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Though, of course, he said it was not as good as Indiana stone, but he spoke very highly of it. A few days afterwards, the company sent some samples of 
<coughs> two kinds of bedford stone and urged the commission to let the company know if it decided to use non-Missouri stone for the building. <coughs> Numerous stone companies from Colorado to Connecticut were sending samples to the commissioners, but Secretary Poole wrote back to them it will be impossible for the Capitol Commission to build the Capitol out of all of other than Missouri stone, even if it desired to do so, even if, if it desired to do so, as the law plainly states, it shall be of Missouri stone and red. When the Southeast Missouri Development Association of St. Louis raised questions uh, about stone in the eastern part of the state, A.A. Spear, the commission vice chairman, told association president John Curran the red granite in Graniteville was very beautiful and perhaps the most durable building stone to be had in the state or elsewhere, but it was also very hard and it was very difficult to work with. It was very expensive to quarry and finish, and because of all of those things, it could not be used if the board stayed within its appropriated amount, the money raised through the bond issue. Poole sent a letter to Steininger Taylor Construction Company of St. Louis listing seven stone quarry firms figuring estimates on the stone for the building. Three of them were from Carthage. Uh, the Carthage Stone Company, the Consolidated Stone Company in Spring River, the Phoenix Marble Company of Kansas City, which had the quarry near Springfield, was joined by the Grant Marble Company of Milwaukee, the Vermont Marble Company, and the Ingalls Stone Company, which had headquarters in New York City, Ingalls did, although Ingalls Stone was actually based in Bedford, Indiana. Uh, he said Phoenix, Carthage, Consolidated, and Spring River were prepared to furnish Missouri, Burlington, Limestone. General Manager F.W. Steadley from the Carthage Quarry Company sent the board a proposal for his quarry to furnish all of the exterior stone needed for $661,493 at O.B. Carthage. The offer was very premature, but it was filed. The contractor bids were opened from the company of 21 representatives from six firms, as well as labor leaders to pronounce such contractors fair or unfair. About uh, 200 representatives of various kinds of material men and builders were there for the day the contract were open. The bids ranged from $2,338,800 to $2,781,000. Uh, the closest of the base bids was a relief to the commission because that meant they could build the building for within their appropriation. It guaranteed the building could be put up. And that allowed them to add in some extra cost features that they listed as options. First four contractors bid on using Burlington limestone mined in southwest Missouri. The other two bid on Missouri stone, not being specific. John Gill and Sons of Cleveland offered to build the capital out of Georgia marble for $2,690,000 or out of Indiana limestone, commonly known as Bedford, in those days for $2,125,000, in addition to Carthage type stone. A few days later, the commission, after weighing all these proposals, awarded the contract to John Gill and Sons of Cleveland. Uh, although the basic bid of one other company was $41,000 less, by the time the other bids were added in, Gill had the best one. Uh, commissioners wanted to compare the different stones mentioned in Gill's bids, didn't have very far to travel because the courthouse in Jefferson City is made of Carthage stone. And the post office, the old post office, now gone and court building, was made out of Bedford. So when all was said and done, John Gill and Sons had the lowest bid with alternates at two million seven hundred and ten thousand dollars to build Missouri's capital. Now the Gill Company was one of the first masonry con contractors in Cleveland, um, and its first significant building had been the Northwest Ohio Lunatic Asylum that was built in 1875. But all of us know one of its other more prominent structures. This was the company that built the old post office in Washington, D.C. It was now the Trump Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> A year after the Missouri contract was signed, Kermode F. Gill became <coughs> the president of John Gill and Sons, and general manager and his older brother John T. Gill became the vice president. And the seeds of a long-running conflict between the contractor and the board were sown the day the contract was signed, which was November 7, 1912. Commissioner Theodore McCaff, uh, who had put up several buildings for the state, was instantly suspicious of a Gill comment when Gill said, you have awarded this contract to Jay Gill and Sons Company, and they will name the stone this capital is going to be built at. McCaff noted that in his diary. 
Contract and bond approved after gilding Burlington Limestone for the construction of the building on my demand. No. But that agreement turned out to be less final than Caiaphas had assumed. And Gill, whose bid specified Missouri Limestone, had other ideas that quickly poisoned the relationship he was to have with the board throughout the rest of this whole process. He might have increased the cast skepticism, if not that of the entire board. When he and his project superintendent, Eric Plunk, left Jefferson City immediately to inspect quarries in Jefferson and St. Genevieve counties. Although the state's Burlington limestone quarries were across the state near Carthage. There's no indication in the record of the board that the board knew Gill was also hurrying off to Bedford, Indiana town that gave its name to a type of limestone here as well as there to meet with Charles C. Ingalls, the head of the Ingalls Stone Company. Gill likely contracted, contacted a few days earlier by the Ingalls representative who'd been to Missouri, had something in mind and it wasn't Southwest Missouri and it wasn't Burlington Limestone. The St. Genevieve area had Bedford, now known as Indiana Stone in the industry. What it did not have was the capability to produce the stone that was needed in the quantities and quality needed in the timing. So Gill and Plump came back a few weeks later, a week later to tell the board that Carthage Stone was at best a very defective stone. The cast diary does not reflect his reaction to that, but he likely had trouble with it because he lived only 50 miles from Carthage and he was often at the Carthage quarries, visited them often after his appointment to the board. He noted their capacity was immense he and other board members doubtless recalled the offer only a few days earlier from the Carthage Quarry to provide all the stone necessary for the building. Missouri's approach of using only Missouri stone was greeted critically by the stone industry throughout the whole country. And a contractor's publication noted the Native Sun concept, as it was called, one of the strongest social and business movements noted in recent years in the Far West, but said any state that does not welcome foreign talent, labor, capital, and business enterprise is bound to remain provincial and unprogressive. A National Journal for Stone Cutters had a different idea. It noted some estimates that the Native Sun approach would cost the state an extra, if, if they abandoned the Native Sun approach, it would cost the state an extra $262,000 to get stone from some other state. And said, pray tell us what is a paltry $262,000 when we stop to consider there are thousands of citizens in the great state of Missouri who obtain their existence from the stone industry, the stone alone in this new building will cost in the neighborhood of $660,000, which is going to stay in the state of Missouri and likely will be spent in the regular channels of trade in the state. The next year got off to a pretty rocky start, 1913, for the board with a report in St. Louis that Spear had said the commission would take steps to have new quarries open if Carthage Quarrymen did not quote what he said was a reasonable price. And that provoked quite a concern in Carthage where a newspaper reported that Gill had known the cost of the stone before he filed his bid. The fixed total cost of the building, no matter what the price of stone might be, is what he based his bid on. So the state would save no money if cheaper stone were used, but Gill would make a kill. Conflicting and competing advice about all this stone and availability came in, much of it doubtless from companies boosting their own products by diminishing the products of others. Gill's contract required him to submit stone samples for the commission approval within six weeks after signing the contract. Gill let it be known there would be no sample until he had examined into the quarry products of the state more fully, especially a possible quarry south of St. Louis. Swartout joined board members meeting with Gill a couple of days later in St. Genevieve for a thorough inspection of a quarry site that they wanted to develop. The board found indications of a very large deposit of excellent oolitic limestone. It also found the quarry was not developed enough to determine if there was enough good stone to begin with. There was no equipment, whatever they said, no facilities for quarrying stone. In fact, the quarry could scarcely be said to be opened at all. A train trip across the state took them to Greene County, where they met with the president of the Phoenix Marble Company. They found a very well equipped plant at work, channeling, sawing, and cutting stone. The next day, they were in Carthage for a very exhaustive inspection of stone plants, equipment, and facilities. And they were assured by the people there there was plenty of stone and it could be provided. 
when a Carthage newspaper reporter asked Stevens if he thought St. Genevieve quarries could produce enough stone for the capital, he was unequivocal. I do not know, he said. <laughs> On the other hand, Gill bobbed and weaved. Were his objections to Carthage stone removed by this visit? I did not know my objections had been announced, he said. <laughs> what are your objections to Carthage stone? That is a leading question. About rumors you wanted to use Bedford, Indiana stone. That is against the basic principles of the law under which the Capitol will be built, he said. Acknowledging St. Genevieve Stone was of the Bedford variety. Did he think the St. Genevieve quarries could be developed to provide sufficient quantities of stone? That is another leading question, he said. Swart out, on the other hand, said Carthage Stone met his expectations. The board spent a lot of the train trip back to Jefferson City from Carthage in a thorough and exhaustive discussion that lasted until the very late hour at night and undoubtedly was surprised the very next day when Gill submitted an elaborate and exhaustive proposal for approval of stone from St. Genevieve, or from the Spurgeon Hill area, referring to the Olytic Bedford limestone of a kind found in the area in Indiana. Schwarthout did not recommend approval of the quarry at St. Genevieve. Um, and rejected, the commission rejected the proposal of St. Genevieve Stone. While the board was inspecting the stone at Phoenix, Ingalls Stone Company president, Charles C. Ingalls, was writing to the board promising to set up a Missouri corporation to open a quarry at St. Genevieve and spend $160,000 to $220,000 for equipment to mine, process, and install the stone from St. Genevieve for the capital. An enormous investment for one project, but Ingalls envisioned the capital project here as being something much bigger. He saw setting up a quarry here as entering a wedge of opening up the stone resources of the state and the first giant expansion of his company. We feel confident that if St. Genevieve Quarry is opened up for the, this building, it will mean the absolute control of all the stone trade of the Great West and the Southwest, cutting off, as it will, owing to the less freight sale, freight rate, the shipment of Bedford stone to that territory, which now is a large market for that stone, and with the opening of the Panama Canal for commercial purposes, it would put the St. Genevieve stone in direct and successful competition with other building stone on the Pacific coast, and in direct competition with Bedford stone in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and other eastern markets. He had dreams of an empire here. Ingalls' commercial ambition would soon be linked with Gill's search for additional profit, and within weeks it would start causing a lot of trouble in Jefferson City. <laughs> Hopes of boosters in far southwest Missouri's Barry County, that was down in Cassville, had been bolstered um, by a contract from the state to provide stone for a new cell block at the state penitentiary in Jefferson City, which still stands, and you can take a tour through it when you tour the prison. Um, it's that cell block that was built with Cassville stone where the 1954 riot started and they did for that matter. But LaCasse Diary dismissed the Castle Stone as possibility for the Capitol. Not long after that, uh, uh, Stevens got a telephone call from a St. Louis lawyer asking to meet with the board to talk about Stone. And Stevens reported that he was told that if the call was an effort to induce the board to go to St. Genevieve route, he was wasting his breath. Stevens told the architects, adding that if Gill did not show up as promised, we simply will be compelled to take steps to compel him to act, and we cannot wait upon this matter any longer. But in fact, wait they did. Stevens reported to Swarthout that Gill had failed to produce stone as promised on the appropriate time, that they were making all the progress they could without him. He had seen reports that Gill had gotten an option on a quarry in Carthage in Jasper County, and he suspected that Gill might try to have Ingalls cut stone there and finish at Jefferson City. Gill also had tried to raise some legal questions and letters to the architects, but he apparently never raised those questions directly with the board. And Stevens said, it looks as though he's trying to start some kind of litigation, but the Attorney General of the State of Missouri said the board's position was impregnable. The board's patience was getting pretty frayed with Mr. Gill by now, and they still hadn't heard from him for the 23rd day. Gill had not submitted required cost figures, nor had he submitted the certain samples of material that would be required for use with the construction of the capital. 
They heard rumors that the quarries in Carthage were combining against Gill to run up the price of burns and limestone. The commission said it wouldn't tolerate that and got assurances that that wasn't the case. Still was no word from Gill. By the time they met in February of 1914, we tried to get our best, we tried our best to get in communication with Mr. Gill, said Stevens, we don't even know where he is. The board drew up a legal notice ordering him to comply within five days, but as the commission was preparing it, the on-site representative of John Gill, a man named David Ehrenberg, said that, reported that samples had been forwarded to Tracy and Swarnow in New York. The Jefferson City Daily Democrat Tribune thought that, that meant that they had last buried the hatchet, but they noted it can be dug up again should the necessity arise. <laughs> and it was. Because a telegram from New York and the architects a few days later back to the commission contained a big surprise. The samples of stone sent to New York were not from Carthage. They were from St. Genevieve. The board's exasperation was expressed in a letter to Swartout, apparently from Stevens, asking why he should persist in pressing this stone in the face of our positive and irrevocable disapproval of it. We cannot understand. The more we have investigated the subject, the more we are confirmed in our wisdom in rejecting this quarry, and the more hopeless has grown the possibility of accepting it. The board maintained Gill's latest maneuver may result in materially, re materially retarding the progress of the building. This means trouble all around. Gill had promised to meet with the commission the next week, although the commission's letter said it had no idea why he wanted to meet it. The board must have been thunderstruck when Gill's attorneys, AEL -E -E Gardner, who was a state senator from Kirkwood, and Boonville Judge William M. Williams submitted a statement that Gill was proceeding rapidly to develop a quarry in St. Genevieve, <laughs> in which stone our bid and contract was based, said the letter. The statement said Gill could not afford to be ordered to do business with Carthage interest because St. Genevieve stone could be quarried for $150,000 less. Stevens told a reporter, we rejected the St. Genevieve limestone four weeks ago, and it is not necessary to do anything further about it. The St. Genevieve Herald commented, the employment of lawyers is taken to mean that Gill will take the matter into the courts. When Gardner was asked about that possibility, he replied that Gill had a trump card to play when the time was right to play it. The furious Stevens responded with a 16-page letter to Gill his professional courtesy barely masking his anger. <laughs> Neither your bid nor your contract could have been based on St. Genevieve Stone, he said. Developing the St. Genevieve Quarry was entirely voluntary and without the sanction, direction, or approval of this board, and if you proceed in such work on such quarry, you do entirely on your own responsibility and without the approval, consent, or direction of this board. And he reminded Gil, that the contract allowed no stone to be delivered at the construction site that came from quarries not approved by the board and reminded Gill of the board's January 17th resolution declaring St. Genevieve Quarry was unfit for the project. Further, Gill was more than a month in default in the contract's provision for submission of stone for board approval. And on top of that, the stone submitted had come from a quarry the board had previously rejected, namely the St. Genevieve Quarry. Stevens was irked that Gill had failed to keep an appointment with the board, even appointments that Gill arranged he didn't show up for. As for Gill's request for an extension of time for the completion of the building beyond the July 1st, 1916 contract deadline, denied. Joppa newspaper said common business reasoning should warn the people of Missouri against allowing contractor Gill to use St. Genevieve limestone. While the people of Missouri have nothing against Mr. Gill, neither does there exist any reason that they should allow him to make a profit at their expense. The editorial quoted state geologist Bueller as saying Bedford limestone is in no sense as desirable as that from Carthage quarries. And Professor Ernest Bertrand of the United States Geological Survey observed the Carthage stone is considerably stronger and less affected by weather and by soot, gases, etc., than Bedford or other stone. It concluded if St. Genevieve stone is used, Mr. Gill will make money, but the state will lose. Kermode Gill was 
somehow surprised that the board had not approved St. Genevieve Stone. <laughs> he claimed to be astonished that any development of St. Genevieve Quarry would be done without the board's consent, writing that the undeveloped condition of this quarry was fully known to you at the time you accepted our bid. And we find no reason in your communication to cause us to recede from our position or from the course heretofore and now in good faith being taken on by us toward carrying out our contract. The St. Genevieve Herald, which had been watching the back and forth between Gill and the Commission, <coughs> told its readers the truth was that notorious lobbyist Bill Phelps had manipulated the Commission to change his stone specifications three times to make sure his hometown of Carthage got the contract and had slipped a joker into the deck in favor of Carthage. That was one that said only fully equipped quarries could be accepted. Phelps was a big time railroad lobbyist in those days. And since the legislators traveled to Jefferson City by train, he was always giving free passes to those people, of course, expecting a return. Vote for things that I want you to vote for and vote against things I don't want you to vote for. So he, he was notorious. In noting that Carthage was the only city that could meet those specifications, the newspaper made no mention of the trump card that Gill supposedly had, or the provision allowing the board to set the quality standards for the stone. A second reference to the Joker a few days later probably upset the commission. The Jefferson City Daily Democrat Tribune reported that Gill had inserted a Joker into his bond, the provision that St. Genevieve Stone would be used. The story said it appeared that only Gill and the bonding company were aware of that provision when the bond was accepted. The board knew otherwise because, because the bond was pasted in the board's minute book and contained no such language at all. Board fumed, but because of public pressure, didn't really want to go too public with this. The last thing they wanted to do was a lawsuit that would only focus attention on the matter and spread this thing out even longer. So they kept working behind the scenes. Gill claimed the board had approved a bid based on opening the St. Genevieve Quarry, which the board quickly denied. Said this board has never at any time approved any stone to enter into the building of the Missouri State Capitol. And told him the board challenges you to point out any act record or proceeding upon which an assertion can be based that it has approved for the building of the state capital, either the stone or the quarry from which it may be taken. We cannot believe that you are serious in acting in good faith when you assert that your bid was based upon the use of stone in the capital building to be taken from St. Genevieve. Such a claim upon your part is at variance with all the facts and circumstances surrounding the submission of your bid. He was reminded the contract required stone from fully developed building quarries specification Gill could find familiar because it was in the federal building contracts that Gill had signed for other projects. The letter considered Gill's behavior during the January trip to quarries of St. Genevieve, Phoenix, and Carthage rather baffling. That's the one where they talk about things on the train coming back. Never at any time on this trip did you claim or intimate to this board that you had submitted your bid based upon the use of St. Genevieve stone or that the stone had been selected and approved by this board, it said. Furthermore, he held extensive discussions with the Carthage Quarry interests and had discussed the stone issues extensively on the train ride back to Jefferson City and never once during all that time had he ever said anything about St. Genevieve Stone. <coughs> Gill made his plans to use St. Genevieve Stone when he submitted his bid. They said your bid would have been instantly rejected. The board was convinced the St. Genevieve Stone was not the best stone required by the state. In fact, he said the stone had never been used anywhere in any building and had therefore not been subjected to the test of time and usage. So once again, he said, we positively and finally declined to give our consent to the use of any stone in the Capitol building, which is wholly an experiment, which is taken not out of a quarry, but out of a hill <laughs> where there is elsewhere in the state stone in ample quantity and in fully developed quarries and at best quality and Although, they said, the use of St. Genevieve stone might save Gill more than $100,000, it would not save the taxpayers of Missouri one single dollar. Any savings would come to Gill. And they will not cheapen the cost of the building to you at the expense of the state. Gill continued to claim he had authority to use the St. Genevieve stone. He never accepted the board's challenge to show any specific language in the contract, though, giving him that power. The same day the letter was sent to Gill, a representative of Bedford, Indiana Stone Interest was here in St. Genevieve, visiting the nearby Burbert Farm, the site of Gill's proposed quarry. 
The local paper reported, we glean that the Southeast Missouri Quarry Company has leased a boat on which they will place powerful hydraulic pumps to wash the ground off the stone ledges, and that this boat is expected at the quarry any day. Other machinery would be installed quickly afterwards to create an enterprise of vast magnitude. The newspaper also had been told that Frisco Railroad would provide special rail service from the city to the quarry to haul the large number of men who will be employed in the quarry, making St. Genevieve their headquarters. Although the newspaper noted the commission had again rejected St. Genevieve Stone, it commented, we are truly glad to see things as far advanced for our quarry was up against a very powerful and thoroughly organized opposition that exerted every imaginable influence against us and in behalf of Carter showed up at the March 20th commission meeting. But he said he had nothing to say. <laughs> Beyond reporting, he was lining up a company to supply the bricks for the Capitol walls and briefly discussing other things, but he never talked about stone, and he left. He was told he should be able to start setting stone for the walls no later than May 15th. But he was not done wheeling and dealing by May 15th. And it wasn't, it wasn't with St. John. Gill had started meeting with B.J. Rosewater, the general manager of quarries in Cassville, and Rosewater had met with Ingalls representatives, and the report said the company had been formed ostensibly to operate in St. Genevieve, Genevieve County, but there was nothing in the incorporation papers keeping it from moving the equipment that supposedly was headed here to Cassville. For it is believed, said the St. Genevieve newspaper, Stone could be quarried as cheaply as in St. Genevieve County. Rosewater reportedly had been told to make the most liberal terms either to quarry the stone or lease the ledges to Gill or Gill's designee in Cassville. The St. Genevieve Herald hoped those negotiations did not mean that Gill had given up his efforts here, and it cited a letter from one who has intimate relations with contractor Gill as proved that Gill has not and will not abandon the intention of using St. Genevieve's stone. Um, the Cassville quarry reportedly was not fully developed either leaving the St. Genevieve newspaper to comment it would be a strange thing for the commission to reject St. Genevieve stone for being from a mirror hill, not a quarry, and then to accept Cassville stone. We do not believe the commission will be guilty of such an inconsistency. The Herald proclaimed, we have the finest stone in the state and the commission acknowledged it when samples were first shown and public opinion will force the commission to accept contractor Gill's choice. Which is St. Genevieve stone, if not, Courts will. But local bravado could not hide the fact that Gill was turning his back on St. John. The board told Gill if work setting stone had not started by May 15th, the board might consider his contract forfeited. He wasn't about to do that. The board threatened to consider his contract forfeited a week later. Swartout told the board that he had met with Gill for several hours and suggested some form of arbitration. But McCaff noted in his diary that the board's answer was no, because there's nothing to arbitrate. Um, there was something of a compromise eventually worked out. The stone crisis has arrived, proclaimed the Jefferson City newspaper when Gill and Ingalls shipped two carloads of St. Genevieve stone to Jefferson City. And the commissioners had told Gill no unapproved stone would ever be unloaded. It's true the board's word, the contract superintendent refused to allow any of the St. Genevieve stone to be unloaded in Jefferson City. Capital Commission Board moved toward a truce with Gill in June of 1914, uh, amending some specifications, it cleared up some things, and it was something of a compromise. Gill had the option of using, with board approval, of stone quality, lithic limestone from St. Genevieve or the side walls of the House and Senate chambers, the rotunda and adjacent lobbies, which later became the museums in the Capitol. The side walls and entablature of the state stairway and for the sculptured friezes under the north and south court. So the deal was worked out. Okay, you can use some St. Genevieve stone. Gill had to submit samples of Burlington limestone and St. Genevieve limestone within 10 days, and the board still reserved the right to determine which limestone Gill could use if it was of good enough quality. The formal memorandum was signed late that afternoon by Stevens and by Gill. Although Gill refused to allow the language saying nothing in the compromise could be construed to limit the board's power to approve a quarry after samples had been produced. Moments after the settlement was approved on June 30th, the board accepted burning the limestone from the quarries in Carthage, Cassville, and Phoenix as complying with the modified specifications. The 
There's an indication that something Cassville has been the key to breaking the deadlock. One report suggested that Gill's options on acquiring Cassville forced terms to become slightly more favorable in coverage. Construction on the exterior walls was to start September 1st and be far enough along for a cornerstone laying October the 6th, which had been the third anniversary of the board's first meeting. The St. Louis Republic commented that Burlington Limestone advocates and the St. Genevieve Stone shouters have agreed that though they were at swords points, the two kinds of building material which they favored can repose in harmony in the same wall. <laughs> Contractor Gill, we judge, is a rather candid individual. He liked his Burlington Limestone better than he liked the price of it. Hence, he might, his mighty show of opposition and his graceful acquiescence when he signed secured an agreement in harmony with his ideas of how much money ought to be spent for stone. The work will now go forward. Headline in one of the Jefferson City papers just said, settle. <laughs> <laughs> but the canny Gill had other ideas. <laughs> Tub thumping had continued in Cassville as spring folded into the summer. Headline proclaiming Berry County Stone will use the new Capitol building. C.C. Ingalls had been down there talking to people. Um, the idea was that maybe 800, the town of 800 people would soon have a lot more people working on the stone quarry there, producing stone for the Capitol from the Cassville Marble and Line Company. But uh, Cassville was setting itself up for a disappointment. One reason was that Charles C. Ingalls wasn't who they thought he was. Although Ingalls claimed to have a subcontract with Gill for the Capitol Stone work, he didn't have a contract, subcontract. At least not a board approved subcontract. Gill and Ingalls signed a contract in August for Ingalls to build a stone mill at Cassville, and Gill was going to provide borrowed money to finance it. C.C. Ingalls was still only Gill, the Gill's only proposed subcontractor for cutting and setting stone. And he claimed at a board meeting in July that Cassville was the only quarry from which he had received a bid, although he had asked for Phoenix and Carthage quarries to submit bids to him. Um, and the Carthage quarry said it was entirely out of reality to think that the Cassville quarries could submit enough stone for the cattle. So that feud was going on. Um, Engel spent the 15th of July that year meeting with Carthage and Phoenix quarry owners who told him he was wrong about the operators combining to manipulate prices. They convinced the Capitol Board that this wasn't going on. The Board's wariness increased a couple of days later when Engels claimed there was no show at all to do any business from Carthage stone people and their quarry's prices were too high and prohibitory under his contract with Gill. Uh, Engel said he would have to open a new quarry at Cassville because the present quarry had insufficient machinery and had little or no capital, <coughs> and they were not responsible financially. The board looked at samples of Burlington limestone submitted under the June 30th agreement. They decided that Carthage stone was going to be the standard for quality and color and finish. They rejected unanimously the sample from Cassville. And that caused big trouble for Gill whose deal with Ingalls was to supply all the capital stone from the Cassville Quarry. He'd advanced $50,000 to Ingalls to build an immense stone mill there. He promised to take over the plant if Ingalls was not chosen to provide the capital stone. Joplin newspaper reported Gill had contracted with the Carthage Superior Marble and Limestone Company for 250,000 cubic feet of stone, but that didn't eliminate a lot of local suspicions about what was going on. The board underlined his impatience by reminding Gill in early August that he had not approved Ingalls as a subcontractor. They had not had a chance to investigate his standing financially or otherwise, said the board. Further, he refu refused to approve Cassville because Ingalls himself had previously said the existing operations in Cassville were inadequate and a new quarry would have to be opened there at nearby, contrary to the board's quarry specifications of the quarries already had to be opened. Gill's apparent selective deafness to the board's messages would continue to cost him because efforts um, continued to develop a quarry at Cassville despite the reported deal with Carthage. And eventually, the whole thing fell apart. Ingalls had bought more than seven acres on which to build his plant and start extracting stone. Forty cars of equipment were being shipped in. Much of this equipment apparently originally intended for St. Jim. Five cars of quarry equipment and three cars of rails for a railroad square before to arrive in late August. McCaff noted in his diary that Stevens and Spear had gone to St. Louis hoping to persuade Gill to get to work. The contractor refused to meet with them. So the board's relationship with him continued to 
go down a hill. Swartout was in the middle looking for a compromise. He said he talked to Gill for an entire day. Finally, they figured out that, that uh, Gill had every expectation that the stone would be gotten out of all the quarries in Carthage, as well as Phoenix and Cassville, where he no longer was talking about St. John. Stephen suspected Gill was just buying time to get his quarry ready in Cassville. And he said, I cannot but regard his determination to establish a plant in Cassville and his effort to get his stone there in any other light than that of a serious mistake. The board was likely unaware that the Cassville Republican had told readers that the plans which are now getting well underway speak for anything. Cassville and Berry County will soon have an industry inestimable in value. Ingalls had started installing machinery there. Still later, construction started on a $35,000 power plant. But Gill knew he was in a losing position and wished he could get out of Cassville deal as much as possible. The commission's attitude clearly was that Gill got himself into the situation and it was up to him to get out. When the board finally met with Gill and Ingalls, he refused to approve Gill's contract with the Ingalls Stone Company in Cassville. He told Gill he must proceed at once to the erection of the walls of the new Capitol building with the best stone in the state and the best stone in the state is Carthage led to outrage in Berry County where the Democratic County Committee called a protest meeting at the courthouse. The Gill told the board it would take 20 months for the Allied quarries in Carthage to furnish the stone, while a Cassville quarry could do it in 13, even though the Cassville quarry was hardly developed. Gill continued to argue there was no available cutting plants of adequate capacity in Missouri to handle the amount of stone needed. Carthage people said, oh yes, there sure is. Rumors that Gill eventually planned to operate a mill in Carthage himself turned out to be true when he bought the Superior Quarry for $75,000 in Carthage. It was not a surprise by then, given Gill's large investment in building machinery and the effort to recover some of his costs. Gill and Ingalls thought they still had stones left to throw. In fact, they had gone to Cassville to speak encouragingly to assured residents that Ingalls had not altered plans to erect a cutting plant. Gill claimed he'd done everything he could most under most trying circumstances to at a great expense to please the board. And it was unfortunate the lack of equipment and quarrying methods forced Carthage quarrymen to for impossible prices. Well, the board wasn't buying any of that either. The board checked with local people in Carthage and found out they'd been telling lies. Stevens later announced definitely the stone fight had been settled and all of the exterior as well as interior stone would be coming from Carthage. Commissioners expressed confidence the building still could be finished by July 1st, 1916. Board members headed to Carthage a few days later to inspect the quarries and the cap wrote, they were all right, okay. When the board met with Ingalls and, and Gill at Cassville, he repeated his earlier message that Cassville would not be used. On November 13th, Gill agreed to start work at once on the Superior Quarry in Carthage. On November 10th, he was in Carthage quarrying stone. It would be sent to Cassville to be dressed. He finally built a wall, a sample wall of Carthage stone that the board quickly approved. But Ingalls was never approved as his subcontractor. Gill wrote, today is the anniversary of the awarding by the commission of this contract to our company, and it has been the most unfortunate and unsatisfactory year of my life. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> himself. I started out on the work with the utmost enthusiasm, and I believe I would have the entire support of this exceptional commission to the end that the Missouri State Capitol building might be one of the very best in the United States. If the commission had only allowed the company to go ahead as agreed last June, well, it hadn't agreed with anything. <laughs> All these questions would have been settled in the satisfaction of everyone and the subject forgotten. If they only let it go ahead by now and approve its subcontractor and leave the entire question up to it, showing that the commission are helpless to force it to deal with any district, I believe it could do more than anything else to satisfy everybody in the state. Then he hinted at a lawsuit. 1914 came to an end on something of a high note. Gill had finally sent some Carthage stone as a sample for interior stone work. Um, the board approved it. And that spelled the end of any hope of Cassville having any stone in the capital. You might remember they had approved the possibility of using Carthage, St. Genevieve stone for some of the interior stone work in 1914. That came to an end, and the board decided it would use Carthage stone on the interior instead. 
Last day of 1914, the first stone was set on an exterior wall of the new building. Your ancestors here in St. Genevieve were pretty much spectators by then. But Cassville interests appear to have been really confused by the developments at the end of the year. Construction started in November on a $35,000 power plant that was, to be, that was being, being called the largest finishing plant for work building stone of Western Chicago at the quarry. Ingalls had started sawing stone on December 1st. Two weeks later, David Ehrenberg, the old man in Jefferson City, spent a day at the quarry and was reported highly pleased with everything out there. But two weeks later, on the 1st of February, all of the workers were laid off at Cassville. The Cassville Democrats said, Lord only knows when business will open up again. A few days later, Cassville residents learned what all the meetings had been about between John Gill and Sons when John Gill and Sons sued Ingalls for $200,000 and sought a lien on the plant and equipment at Cassville. It was a 40 page lawsuit. Eventually, it became a 4,000 page lawsuit to consider all of the evidence before it was settled out of court many years after the state capitol was built. Ingalls finally settled out of court. The sad thing is, all of those 4,000 pages of evidence cannot be found by the Greene County Circuit Clerk, which is where the court was, the, the case was heard. If we could find those papers, that evidence, we might have an even better understanding of what was going on in St. Genevieve, because it would tell us what the business arrangement was between Gill and the people from Bedford, Indiana. Those records are there. Nonetheless, nonetheless, thank you. April of 1916, three cars of stone were being shipped every day from Carthage. By the end of May, 12 carloads had been shipped in one week. The output was expected to double very shortly. So John Gill and Sons continued to build that building. Governor Elliott Major had a few days left in his term when he dictated a letter on January 2nd, 1917, carefully noting he was meeting, he was doing so in a meeting with the Capitol Commission Board in the governor's office, the private office in the new capital. It was the first, he signed his message there to the General Assembly, the first official act in the new building. For four years, he'd worked in the temporary capital building that was constructed nearby, and he deserved a day in the new capital before he left office. A new governor came in, he was sworn in outdoors for the first time because the ceremonies couldn't be held in the new building. And then, a few days after that, during the 1917 session, the members of the House and Senate decided they wanted to have a meeting in the new Capitol too, even though it was not completed. They had no furniture in their rooms, but they set up portable chairs. So the members of the 1917 session, who would not be back in 1919, could say they had worked in the new Capitol too. <laughs> project left a bad taste in Kermel Gill's mouth. He said, I might say confidentially that I would be much better off if I had never undertaken the structure and had never come out west to your state of Missouri and made a bid on the building. But notwithstanding Mr. Gill's doleful conclusion in the interviews, his concern does not seem to be near the verge of bankruptcy, said the newspaper, although it is generally declared by well-informed contractors he was telling the truth about the profits he intended to make. The newspaper said it is known that four or five contractors had gone broke and would not finish their work meaning that he had to pick up that work himself and pay for it out of his pocket. The completion deadline was moved to April 1, 1917, nine months before the, beyond the original completion date. It was moved to May 15th, it still wasn't ready. Finally, on September 13th, 1917, a master key to all of the 500 doors in the building was presented to the Capitol Commission, along with 500 separate keys, so many keys that the keyboard the keyboard was eight feet long and four feet wide. <laughs> so St. Genevieve turned out just to be a bargaining chip that a contractor and an Indiana Stone executive thought they could use to make a quick $100,000 to $150,000 profit on constructing the Missouri Capitol. Um, these commissioners built the building well within the appropriations, and they had a million dollars left over from the bond issue money. And they spent that million dollars on the artwork that decorates our capital, the paintings, the sculpture, the tapestries, and the stained glass windows. And although there's no stone from St. Genevieve in the capital, there is a very lovely painting of old St. Genevieve done by Oscar Berninghaus, a St. Louis artist who was one of the founding fathers of the Talos Society of Artists in New Mexico. I 
hope if you haven't been to the Capitol, I hope you come and see that painting along with all of the other wonderful artwork we have there. So this great project that for a while generated so much hope for the people of St. Genevieve was completed. But St. Genevieve Stone was not completed. Today, our state capital is slowly disappearing behind scaffolding and a giant plastic ramp that is going to let restorers continue their efforts with heat and air conditioning during the winter months and summer months. In the next two years, the state is spending $29 million in cleaning and restoring the stone over which Gill and the commission fought a century ago. About 5% of the stone is going to be replaced. And a few weeks ago, the Capitol Commission, the new Capitol Commission, met on the north side of the building where some stone from quarries in Oklahoma, Kentucky, and Missouri had been placed in places so that the commission could take a look and determine which stone best matched the original color and quality of the stone that was put up in the, in the Gill controversial years. They didn't know which state produced which stone, but they looked up there and they picked the stone and it's from Phoenix. <laughs> the Phoenix Quarry in, near Springfield was closed for many years and only reopened about 10 years ago. And when they replaced the front steps of the Capitol, or some of them, steps that had been redone in 1968 using Bedford limestone and they crumbled and chipped and discolored. Now, many of those steps have been replaced by Burlington limestone and Phoenix. And when you go to the Capitol and you're able to close, get close enough, you can tell which steps are which. So St. Genevieve turned out to be just the bargaining chip. The scheme eventually got settled. The lawsuit was settled in Springfield. And we don't know what those missing records could have told us. But that's what history is all about, really. We save what we know and we regret what's lost because it means something we can never learn. But even at that, we're left with a great story. And in this case, we're left with a great and wonderful building. And I hope you come to Jefferson City often and see your capital, not because St. Genevieve could have had stone in it, but because of what the building is today and what it stands for. Come and visit us often and love the capital as much as many of us who've worked in it for so long out of it. I'll see you.